Bibles with you this morning, you'll notice that our theme passage continues to be Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. But you'll notice in the subheading that we will be dealing with God's uh, means for spiritual growth. So we'll use Hebrews chapter 10 as a launch point, but I am going to move through the different means of grace that God uses to bless his people <clears throat> in a topical fashion this morning. So uh, don't trouble yourself with trying to keep up with all the passages. Just listen closely and the manuscript or the notes can be published to you at a later date if need be. And so these words are recorded in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we love you and we bless your holy name. Thank you for gathering us together as your people to hear your word. We pray now that you would give us understanding, soften our hearts, open our eyes, open our minds to receive from you today. Clear the block out of deaf ears. And God, we ask that you would help me, that you would anoint me for this, your task. I boast now in my weakness that your power will rest upon me. May my words be yours and what is not of you, let it fall to the ground. Not to us, O oh Lord, be the glory, not to us, but to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, by now, all of you all who know me should know that I love a good cookout. I love a good buffet. Those are all things that, yes, yes, there's no secret about that. You can ask my wife. She's, she's not as buffet inclined, but so whenever we talk about places to go out and eat, I always will, you know, I'll give her that look and she'll say, is there another place? <laughs> Buffets are great. You got so many options. I mean, I've got so many buffet stories. You know, I love the, the marquees. Take all you can, but eat all you take. You know, I, I've been a part of, a part of uh, uh, family lines that, and groups of people that when we walk in inside the buffet, people, people start to sweat. People start to worry. I, I've been a part of groups of people where in one fell swoop, the whole crab section, rice, all that's just cleared out. I've been a part of buffet outings where we, where they stop serving us drinks. You know, when someone stops talking, that usually means that they, they've either got to go or something's wrong or they've lost interest. They stop serving us drinks. I don't think it's because they wanted us to go. I think it's because they were fascinated by how much we were consuming. And believe it or not, I was not the biggest person in that group. There was another gentleman about 6'5", 370. He was a Tongan. So I looked up to him and he blocked the sun from me. He was a teammate of mine. And so uh, we've had all kinds of fun, exp fun experiences with eating. But I got to say, one of the most meaningful ones is when you gather for a potluck. You see, because a potluck is a little different than just going to a buffet. It is a buffet of sorts, but a potluck, you bring your offerings, if you will. You bring uh, that which you're good at cooking. I know there's some people in this congregation that can cook because I've experienced it. There are people who can cook Norwegian meatballs. I'm not looking in any direction. There are people who've got great mac and cheese, Italian meatballs, greens, all that stuff. And you've seen some of the Facebook posts. But one thing about going to a potluck is you bring something to bless other people, but you can come knowing that you will walk away blessed. And saints, it's the same thing with corporate worship. We come to bring our offerings. We come to bring our sacrifice of praise. We come to be a blessing to our brothers and sisters. But we can come, we can gather in corporate worship expecting that God will bless us, that we will be changed, that we will be moved by God, that he will do something in our life as a result of coming in contact with him for Lord's Day worship. And so you know that we've been going through this series, a renewed vision of the gathering. So our heart's desire is to understand just all the implications and how great it is to gather for Lord's Day worship on Sunday. We already expressed in our last message that sometimes people have a, an antagonistic view about it. Oh, they hear that people aren't coming to church, the, the, the culture's in decline, but we want to continue creating a compelling message as to why people should come 
to Lord's Day worship. We discovered last time that we bless each other and that we're meeting with heaven and earth. So this morning we want to deal with um, the theme of corporate worship being a special mm -hmm. service where Christians worship God in community and are blessed through his ordained means of spiritual growth. So not only, we gonna, not only do we talk about the, the grand story of what's happening in worship, but we're going to bring it right down to the brass tacks, to the practical realities of what is taking place with the different elements here in worship. And in our tradition, we call these the means of grace, okay? The means of grace. You may have heard me in uh, new members class say that we are an ordinary means of grace ministry. That is, we believe that God uses ordinary things like a person standing up front, a man standing up front preaching the word of God to his people, that God uses the administration of sacraments. That is, he allows us to eat physical things that are real. They're very plain, but he does something great in them. And he also uses prayers, the prayers of his people to accomplish his will. So we believe that those are the means that God uses to bless his people. All right, in our tradition, Three get the most attention. That's word, sacrament, and prayer. They receive the most feature. However, even in our tradition, there are people who would include fellowship or communion of the saints, the gathering of God's people as a means by which God blesses us. And, and for compelling reason. I'm one of those people who are very sympathetic to that, but I lock arms with our forefathers who highlight uh, the word, the sacrament, and prayers as the means by which God uses to bless his people. And um, <clears throat> Velma and Van Genderen, uh, two uh, Reformed theologians, say that uh, the word sacrament and prayers are means that are employed by the Holy Spirit to make us partake in communion with Christ, which in turn strengthen us, strengthens us spiritually, uh, in spiritual maturity, excuse me. So the Holy Spirit uses these ordinary things to do extraordinary things in our life. And so with all of that, let me just distill it down to a simple statement that in short, we are going to talk about the major components of our worship service, our Sunday morning service, and how God uses them to make us more like Jesus. If you look at the Word of God, the preeminent means of grace, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1 gives us a helpful summary on what God's Word is. God's word, the Bible, is his self-disclosure. In the Bible, God reveals who he is and what kind of life is the best life for his creatures. As simple as I can state it, God reveals to us who he is in the Bible and what is God's design for his creatures, okay? That's the word of God. Now, we can know about God by looking at the creation. We can know about God by looking at the universe, we can know that a God exists because we have a conscience, a sense of right and wrong. So there's a Godness that's in every individual because every individual was created in God's image. However, that's not enough to know how to have a relationship with God. Okay, we know that he exists, so no one stands, no one is with excuse. We can look out at the creation and see someone is bigger than us. But the question is, how do we come to know this one? That comes through the word of God, the Bible, which reveals who he is and reveals his will for our lives. The distinction is general revelation and special revelation. We can generally know God exists, but the special revelation is found in the word of God that you are holding in your hands. So in our tradition, the word of God gets a lot of attention, and rightfully so. In, in most every church tradition, it gets a lot of attention, and that should be the case. But you may be asking yourself the question this morning, well, what's so important about the Word of God? What's, so, what's the big deal about this Bible? What's the big deal, uh, Pastor? And that's a good question if you're asking that. Maybe you're visiting with us this morning, and you've never heard this terminology before. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, and you've never heard this terminology before, and that's okay. We're all at different places in our spiritual journey. But God accomplishes, God's word accomplishes his purpose to save people from their sins. It accomplishes his purpose to save people from their sins. People like you and me, sinners. 
God uses his word to save people like you and me from their sins. People come to initial faith um, <clears throat> primarily through the preaching of God's word. Now, some of you may say, well, pastor, I came to faith by sitting down in the living room reading the Bible, and that's fine. Some of you may, be, may say that um, somebody knocked on my door and witnessed to me and told me about having a relationship with Jesus, and that's how I came to faith. But for the most part, throughout church history, in antiquity, people were illiterate. So there was a lot of reliance on the preached word for people to come to faith. And at various points in the history of our country, we had groups of people who could not read, who could not write, but the word of God was preached and they came to faith. So the word of God is the means by which God implants faith into people. Okay, that's how they come to faith, the preached word, all right? And it's also the way that people are strengthened in their faith. In Romans chapter 10, a classic passage on evangelism, Paul says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the preached word has no ethnic boundaries. It goes out to everybody. Any person from any culture, any socioeconomic background, you name it. Whatever you are in life, wherever you are in life, if you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. If you believe that he is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. End of sentence. If you believe that now, you are saved. If you just heard that for the first time and you've accepted that, you are now saved. Talk to me after the service. It is that simple. The message is that simple, but it's much more grand. Going on, Paul quotes Isaiah 52. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? So the question is, how does this message get to people? All right. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Beloved, do we see the significance of the preached word? God sends preachers to proclaim the word of God. This morning, me standing up here preaching to you is not me just giving you a lecture on advice, on conflict resolution, or on self-help. I am proclaiming to you the word of God. All right, this is God's message to his people, he uses this ordinary event to accomplish his supernatural means. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith, listen, comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So the Lord uses the preached word to bring people to faith initially. That's not to say that there are not other means that people don't sit at home and read or that people aren't tapped on the shoulder. That's not to say that God is bound to this means, but it means that God primarily uses this. He uses it often and ordinarily, and we can expect that this will be the means that he uses to bring multitudes to faith because his word declares it. Isaiah 55 tells us, gives us confidence in such. He tells us in verse 10 and 11, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return, return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is the prophet Isaiah saying that God's word will accomplish the saving of sinners like you and me. We can have confidence in that church that when God's word goes out, it is accompanied by the power of his spirit and it will accomplish God's ends. You and I are evidence of that. Acts chapter 2 gives us a powerful illustration of just how effective 
God's word is. At Pentecost, when Peter is preaching, he tells them, repent and be baptized, all of you, for the remission of your sins. For the, the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off. And if you go down a few more verses, verse 41, it says, so those who received his word were baptized. They believed. They came to faith. And how many people were impacted by this message? And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So do we see the primacy, the primacy of God's word? Do we see how significant God's word is? God uses his word to bring people out of darkness into light, to bring people out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. He uses his word to implant faith in people by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of God is also useful for us in spiritual growth in those for those who come to faith in Christ. So not only is it initially used by God, but it's continually used by God. Peter tells us in first Peter. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So as God's people, we ought to long for his word. The psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. God's word is not burdensome. It's like the sweetness of the honeycomb. It nourishes us. It feeds us. It reminds us of God's promises. He tells us in 2 Peter that we have the word, a more sure we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Who's the author of the word of God? God. He uses ordinary, he used ordinary people like you and me to write the word of God. It didn't originate in their own personality. It originated in God, but God used their personality, their humanness to write this word, this final and closed word. And Paul tells Timothy in his dying days, preach the word, Timothy. Keep preaching it because it's profitable. What? It's uh, profitable. He said, be ready in season and out of season. Re Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And he goes on to say there will come a time where people not, will not endure sound doctrine. So Paul tells Timothy, here is the antidote uh, to what you're facing. He says, people will not listen to the truth, but you keep on preaching the truth. Because the only thing that's left when, when all of that that's not the truth fails is the truth. It's either true or it's not. And Paul says, Timothy, you keep on preaching. God will do what he said he would do. There will be some people that will reject it. There'll be some people who eventually will come around. But Timothy, you keep on preaching the truth. Aitchison, you keep on imparting Christ to Christ United Fellowship. That's all I have to offer you. It's Christ and him crucified. That's all. I, that's my message. It's the apostolic message. I know of no other thing that will get you into the kingdom and that will give you strength in this life. And he's the risen Lord. He's not only crucified, he's the risen Lord. If he didn't raise from the grave, we're in trouble. That's all I have to offer you. I remember when I was in college, I was meeting, I was uh, in the bathroom washing my hands and this person came up to me who, who I'd met and said, uh, man, how was church on Sunday? I said, it was great. I said, well, how about yours? He said, man, the spirit was so high that the pastor didn't preach the word. <laughs> and I said, I don't know what spirit you are, yo. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, the word of God is the means that God uses to bring people in. And the word of God is the means that he uses to continue strengthening people. So I, I just have concerns about no word being preached. God's people aren't being strengthened. They aren't being encouraged. They aren't being built up and rooted in Christ if the word is not being preached. We see here, that's one of our, that's our top core value at CUF, Christ Center Preaching. If you notice on the back of your bulletins, if you look on our website, Christ Center Preaching is our first core value because we know of no other way whereby a person is saved 
or continue or, or strengthen in their spiritual journey except through the proclamation of Jesus Christ. We see not only that the Lord uses the word, but he uses the sacraments. Now, that's a, a big word that, that can mean many things depending on your, your Christian experience. But let me just tell you in short, the sacrament, a sacrament is a mystery, okay? Uh, mysterion in Greek, sacramentum, sacrament, sacramentum in Latin, and that's how you get sacrament in English, okay? I, uh, and the Sacramento Kings, I guess, is a mysterious team in the NBA. Did it? All right, I'm, I'm working on my puns. I'm working on my dad jokes. A tough crowd this morning, okay? And so the sacraments, as defined by the Westminster Confession of Faith, that's our document that tells everybody what we believe, are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace, immediately instituted by God to represent Christ and his benefits and to confirm our interest in him, as also to put a visible difference between those that belong unto the church and the rest of the world, and solemnly to engage them to the service of God in Christ according to his will. So, in short, the sacraments, okay? We have the Lord's Supper right here before us today. We have the sacrament of baptism. Some of the babies that were born here recently will be baptized. They'll receive infant baptism. Some of you have received baptism as adults because you came to believe in God, okay? These are physical elements that communicate spiritual realities. That bread is not magic, the water is not magic. But God uses this event, okay, to do something in the life of his people to communicate spiritual realities, okay? And if we were to break it out, we see that they're given by God to represent Christ and his benefits, Okay, they are physical signs that point to spiritual realities. They also authenticate or seal or confirm these realities are true for us by faith. So it's like the king when he stamps the document or the edict with his signet. It makes it official. It ratifies it. It authenticates it. When we participate in the sacraments, that is God saying, I'm putting my stamp on you that this is real for you if you have received it by faith. These realities are yours. The definition tells us, the confession tells us that it represents the redemptive work of Christ. They represent the covenant of grace. And who's the substance of the covenant of grace? It's Christ. Jesus Christ comes to us. He reveals the grace of God to us. We, know, we come to know the grace of God by the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, applied to us by the Holy Spirit. They confirm that we have a share in Christ. They mark us out as God's people, just as you join a society and may have to go through an initiation process. The sacraments are God's sort of emblems, his signs and seals that say you are a part of the visible church. You see, the church is a society. It's an eternal society. A society whose head is Christ, you see. And so we are marked out by the sacraments, and they call us to full and sole allegiance to Christ. <clears throat> They're also administered by a minister who is lawfully ordained, a minister of the word, <clears throat> and not apart from the church, okay? They're given as elements of the church. It's a sign of entrance, and it's a sign of continuation, so you cannot sit at home after the word of God has been preached to, from someone on the computer or TV and then subscribe to the sacraments. Saints, it doesn't work like that. All right, we cannot evade the reality that Christianity is a corporate religion. You cannot. You, can, you can't... In, when you pick up the Bible, you, if you think that you were meant to run the race by yourself, the Bible will over and over and over again shoot that down. The Bible will say, nope, you are meant to be a part of a body. And let's just say the preacher is preaching and you come to faith in your living room. Well, you know, the next thing that has to happen, you must be baptized. And you can't order baptism on demand. You can't. You cannot pour water over your head in the name of the triune king. You cannot. I'm sorry if 
I'm the bearer of bad news this morning. Okay? You won't find it on Netflix or Hulu or any other of those subscription services. You must come into the gathering, okay, because it is there in the church where the sacraments are administered by God's teachers. The sacraments are given by God to the church, administered by the teachers of the church to represent membership in the church. Paul tells the Corinthians, this I receive, I commend to you. All of these things, baptism, was given by the Lord Jesus to the apostles, the apostles to the church. The Lord's Supper, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks, he blessed it. He broke it. Do this in remembrance of me, he's talking to his apostles. Who are the architects of the church, humanly speaking, the apostles, the teachers? Ephesians chapter 4, God has given teachers, ministers, pastors, shepherds to the church that he uses to carry out, to administer his sacraments. We have two in our tradition, baptism and the Lord's Supper. A helpful definition of baptism is found in the Westminster Confession of Faith, a shorter catechism, uh, question 94. It says, what is baptism? Baptism is a sacrament wherein the washing with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost doth signify and seal our engrafting into Christ and partaking of the benefits of the covenant of grace and our engagement to be the Lord's. All right, I quoted Matthew uh, chapter 26, Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, Jesus says, all right, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go ye therefore and baptize, go ye therefore to all the nations, baptizing them in the what? The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. He institutes baptism. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the rite of initiation. It shows that you are a member of the visible church. The invisible church, those who are truly God's people are only known to him. We can't be the judge of that. We only look at the fruit. But this is a sign that you are a member of God's visible church. It's the right of initiation, if you will. All right? All those who profess faith and their children ought to be baptized. That's what we hold to be true in our tradition. Not only does it show initial entrance into the church, but God uses it to strengthen us. Westminster Confession of Faith, larger catechism question 167 says, how is our baptism to be improved by us? I won't read through the whole thing. But at our baptisms here at CUF, we are deliberate. We take time because we believe that God does something. He actually strengthens his people who have been baptized at the administration of it to others. Okay, 167 tells us when we see others being baptized, we ought to think about the significance and what our baptism means. Think about what God has done for us in Christ. We understand that our baptism is useful by growing up to assurance of pardon of sin and all other blessings sealed to us in the sacrament. So all the benefits of Christ are communicated to us. And when we see somebody else being baptized, we're to contemplate all the things that are true for us in our baptism. But I told you, you can't get away with thinking Christianity is individual because the last clause says, and to walk in brotherly love as being baptized by the same spirit into one body. Paul says that we've been baptized into the same spirit. Saints, let me tell you, we, we, we cannot avoid the reality that we were meant to do life together. That's God's design. You were not meant to run the race by yourself. If you are a person who professes faith in Jesus and you have been baptized, you are saying, you are pledging that I am also a part of another body of people who believe the same things. That's one of the significance about coming to corporate worship. <clears throat> Paul reiterates this for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11. Not only do we see that baptism is... Uh, one of the sacraments that the Lord uses. But he also uses the Lord's Supper. Another helpful definition, Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 29. Our Lord Jesus, in the night wherein he was betrayed, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood called the Lord's Supper to be observed in his church unto the end of the world for the perpetual remembrance of the sacrifice of himself in his death, the sealing 
all benefits thereof unto true believers, their spiritual nourishment and growth in him, their further engagement in and to all duties which they owe unto him, and to be a bond and pledge of their communion with him, and watch this, and with each other as members of his mystical body. Our baptism signifies that we are family, and when we come to the table, it signifies that we are family. That's why when we finish the table, we say, if you have an issue with somebody, be reconciled before coming. Because when you come to the table, you not only agree with God, you agree that we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. Paul rebukes the Corinthians for their abuse of the Lord's Supper. They were serving themselves. People were being left out. Socially, there was all kinds of nonsense taking place. People were getting left out. They were getting drunk. And Paul says, what is this you've gathered for? This is not the Lord's Supper. He said, eat at home. You're coming. People are being skipped. People are being left out. The poor were being overlooked. There was a lot of isms taking place. So all that the Lord's Supper signified was being handled roughshod there at the Corinthian church. Listen, saints, just as God nourishes us through the consumption of food physically, he nourishes us through the consumption of these elements spiritually. Do you see that there? They're ordinary, but they point to spiritual realities. That's why you hear me say, as real as they are to our physical senses, Christ is real to our faith. That's what's happening here at CUF. And then our last means of grace there is prayer. A shorter, much shorter definition, but I find very helpful by John Frame quoting Wayne Grudem says, it's personal communication with God, whether individually or corporately. That's prayer. It's communication. It's communing with God. And we see prayer has always been characteristic of God, God's people from old to new, from the patriarchs, Lord, the Psalms over and over again, they are prayers, they are songs for worship. Jesus, during his earthly ministry, retreated from the crowds often to pray. We have his high priestly prayer for us and for those who are yet to believe the prayers of our Savior. We have Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, telling Peter and the rest of the crew, can you all pray for me? Something is about to happen. Lord, if at all possible, let this bitter cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We see prayer all throughout the Bible. We see Paul telling us in 1 Thessalonians 5 to pray without ceasing. We are commanded to pray. Paul tells us to pray for all kinds of people, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And what is the content of our prayers? What's actually happening when we pray? Well, a helpful acronym I find is ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. We adore God. When we opened the service this morning, we invoked his presence. We said, God, bless us. Come, be near to us so that we might bless you back. Why do we want to bless God back? Because he's worthy of our praise. That's why we sing the doxology. We praise God. Okay, song is prayer with music to it. We're praising God. We're adoring him for who he is. We confess our sins today. Some of you this week may be walking with a head, may be coming here with a heavy load and just need to confess to God that you've messed up and to receive assurance that you are still his child. That's why we do that at the confession. And you ought to model your life like that the rest of the week. You don't have to wait till Sunday to confess. Get on your knees. Sunday shapes us for Monday through Saturday. Is there a witness? Sunday is where we come to be shaped and to be formed and to be encouraged by God's people so that we would do these things all the days of our life. We also come with supplications. We pray for people. We pray for our needs. We ask God. James says, come and believe that God will provide. All right, you have not because you ask not. We come and we pray and we pray for our city, we pray for the lost, we, we pray for everything that we can according to God's will. Those are supplications. But not only do we pray these things, but we have God's assistance. You heard me this morning that the Holy Spirit 
prays for us. Did you know that, saints? That the Holy Spirit, who is indwelling you right now, prays for you when you don't know what to say. In the middle of the night when all you can do is just spout out tears because you can't sleep. The Holy Spirit prays for you in accordance with God's will. God is good from first to last and everything in between. That's the kind of God that we serve. When we come to corporate worship and engage in prayer, it's a reminder that we are not only to pray for ourselves and to be concerned about our own deeds, but we're to be concerned about the welfare of others. And when we pray in corporate worship, not only is that, not only are you reminded of the call to do that, but you are reminded that someone else is praying for you. That's what's happening in corporate worship, saints. We're coming to the full realization that we're in this together in God's presence. Doesn't matter what you look like. I'm black. You can see me. God created that way, me that way. I'm brown. I won't be anything else. That's who I am. But my primary identity is Christian. And so that means I'm called to pray for you no matter what you look like. No matter how much money or how little money you have. I pray for every last one of you and your children. I pray for our visitors that come. And we're all called to do the same thing. Corporate worship reminds us in a very special way that we are called to think about someone else's welfare and someone is called to think about our welfare. And if you don't get it, then come to worship and experience it. God says, all right, if you don't believe me, just come to corporate worship and you'll find it out yourself. The means of grace speak of a God who goes after his people graciously and then reminds them their entire life, that he is their God and that they are his people. And that sweet saints, that's the covenant promise. I will be your God and you will be my people. And when we participate in the means of grace, we're fully reminded of that. And you've heard through the preach word this morning, the good news already, that Jesus died for sinners like you and me and that God raised him from the dead and if you believe that this morning, you will be saved. And if that's something you want to talk about and think about and engage, talk to me after the service. Or if you're visiting, talk to whoever invited you to the service about that reality. <clears throat> Our prayer for those who love Jesus is John in Revelation 22. Come now, Lord Jesus. We want Jesus to come yesterday. When he comes, it's better for all of us. But in the meantime, he's given us just a taste of heaven. He's given us a sacrament whereby we are strengthened, whereby we are built up in Christ, whereby if we can't hear and understand what he did through the preach word, he says, let me show you what I did. And that's what we're preparing to do this morning at the Lord's table and one day, one day, Jesus will come back and we will feast together at the marriage supper of the Lamb for all eternity. So saints, when we come here and gather for corporate worship, we are rehearsing eternity right now. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father.